He's going all in on both sides of the board. The Chess World Cup is the largest tournament bracket that I've ever seen. 206 players, $1.8 million in prize fund, and three tickets to the candidates tournament. Anish Giri is seated number five. He's a former 2,800 player, almost. His peak official rating was 2,798, making him the 15th highest rated player ever. Plus, he's an amazing commentator. Overall, really good dude. And who's he up against? Mijat Abasov. He's the local hero. He's from Azerbaijan. That's where this tournament is happening. And Nijat just made it to the top 100 list. He didn't make it before this event. And he's a relative unknown. He's coming from a 140 point rating gap. And he's playing match play against Anish. This is a single elimination tournament. You have to win this mini match to keep moving forward. Nijat with the black bases went up not only one pawn, he went up two pawns, but he's playing against Anish and Anish is an endgame nightmare. After all the dust settles, even down two pawns, it's bishops of opposite color. Anish is able to hold out of this. It's a draw for the first game. So now the second game, Nijat, he's got the white pieces. If he's able to secure a win, he moves forward in the tournament. This is classical chess. Each player has about two hours in the game. But as this game progresses forward, there's a bunch of trades. It goes pretty quickly. And at the end of it, each player has more than 99% accuracy in the game. No player ever had an advantage, and it's a draw. So what does that mean for this tournament? It means that the time increases, the speed increases. Each, now, they're going to have about 30 minutes each. Let's see what happens when the speed increases. This next game is decisive. It's not going to be another boring draw. We are in game three. Each player gets a chance as white. Each player gets a chance as black. And Anish got the white pieces here. And we can see that Nijat, he's going for a dark squared control. He just played this E5 move. And it's a little bit committing. It weakens this D5 square, but we'll see what he has in mind. We see just a couple of moves later, he is fully committing to this dark squared plan. Anish. He moves forward here with b4. That might look like a free pawn right here, but with some crazy tactics, if you capture, you get this recapture, and you can see that the queen is lined up here with the bishop. And so after, you know, some craziness going on here, you're going to lose your queen. You know, obviously there's other ways to play it, but all that being said, that this pawn is uncapturable. So instead of that, Abasov, he moves forward, and we get this trade. He gets voluntarily takes doubled pawns. You can check out my video on that. I don't hate it at all. After this b6 trade, I see this pretty weak potential a3 pawn, or if you can make it all the way to the end game, that outside pawn could be an asset. And then this d5 move, that's not a move I would consider basically ever, but, you know, Anish plays it. That's why he's in the game. I'm not in this game. And we can see here the black queen is getting attacked. And we have this really, really cool move by Abasov. Let's see if you can see it. I bet you can't. He captures this knight. And obviously the whole idea being you recapture the queen this way. And when the dust settles, we have even material. We both have the same color bishop. And we'll see, kind of see how it goes. Um, this is technically a passed pawn. Um, but it's very, very far away. It doesn't really have any real risk of going. The computer says we're at zeros. So we attack the knight, counterattack the bishop, and we have this trade. And now there's a little bit of a material imbalance. We have knight versus bishop. Bishops are typically better in the endgame. They're the long-range piece, particularly in this endgame, where the position's a little bit more open. King starts coming into the game. And now we have this weird decision by Abasov where he trades off rooks. We mentioned that the bishop's a little bit better, and it's going to be a little bit easier for Anish to win this endgame. And usually when you have a set of rooks on the board, that's going to make it a little bit easier for you to draw. But he makes this decision anyway. And then we're moving forward here, and the white king is infiltrating, and we trade off 
these two pawns. And this is, again, a weird decision. If we go back right here with trading off these pawns, that's going to make this A3 pawn a big strength. But this is what happens. That trade happens. And now we can see that this pawn, this square is covered, this square is covered, this square is covered, and the bishop covers this A8 square. So this pawn is potentially going to become a big liability. And right here, you might think, hey, let's just move forward. Let's play A5. But the idea that Abasov would have for defense is you would be able to capture and recapture here. And now all you have to do is trade off either this pawn for this pawn, or what you could even do is trade off all three of your black pawns for this one G pawn, run your king all the way over to the corner, and that would be a draw. Anish knows that, so instead of doing that, he pushes his king forward. He tries a different way, and now with these pawns locked over, they're all locked on light squares, we can see that Anish is able to capitalize. When this pawn starts moving forward, the king is able to reach the square of the pawn. This pawn is going forward. This pawn is going forward. This bishop is just getting all over the place. Anish is able to bring in this win. And now Abasov, he's got a chance with the white pieces. Since these are pairs, he has to win this game. He can't draw it. A draw means that Anish proceeds forward. Abasov is out of the tournament. Let's see what happens. Okay, so Abasov starts off right here. He plays queen pawn. This is actually what he played in his first game as white. This is still what he played in his first game as white. This is still what he played at his first game as white. And right here, this knight to e5 move is the first divergence from that very, very quick draw where both players played more than 99% accuracy. In that game before, what he had done instead is he had played this d5 move. Um, so he switches it up a little bit. Let's see what happens. He pushes out on a4. He needs to, you know, start putting it to black. He pushes out on h4. He's going all in on both sides of the board. Did I say he was going all in? He's going all in. Now he plays g4. He needs to make something happen. He needs to make as much chaos on the board happen as possible. And with both of these pawns pushing forward and this knight securely fastened here on e5, a lot of good stuff could happen. And so Geary, naturally, he's going to get his knight over here. He's going to try to dislodge that knight. And right here, Anish captures this pawn. He doesn't need to do that. He is opening up his king he should be, you know, turtling up, figuring out a way to just wait for Abasov to come at him. But it's really scary. He's trying to simplify. He takes this knight off the board. And this rook recapture in the center of the board is a little bit, I guess, unintuitive. But when you think about it, this knight can't go right here to kick the rook out. It can't really go right here. And that's the only piece that could really kick it out. So it seems fairly safe right there. The queen comes over. The bishop comes over. Ampassant, it's a moral imperative. He has to do it. And as we move forward in the game, we get both rooks doubled up in the center of the board. But white's king doesn't necessarily look that safe either. Now, the white king is open. The black king is open. I know that I could lose this game as white, and I could also lose this game as black. Luckily, both of these players are much better than myself. So let's see what happens. Abasov, he moves forward, he gets his rook up, and right now, Anish, he is threatening checkmate here on h1. Rook to h1 is checkmate if nothing happens. Anish, he offers a queen trade right here. Naturally enough, the pressure is very, very high, and this trade happens. And then Anish, he moves his rook back to g8. That's a really ugly passive rook, but it needs to happen. The bishop comes in and the king moves forward. Abasov, he's threatening to win a pawn on d5. Knight moves back and the king is being pushed forward. Abasov creating some weaknesses in that camp. And now chess.com gives this recapture a brilliant move. I don't know what the hell else Anish was going to do, but he recaptures that pawn. And now... Anish makes the critical mistake of the game. He moves his king back to f8. He should have moved it back to d8. Can you see why that's going to be such an issue? Abasov does. He moves his knight forward here, and he is threatening checkmate on f7. Anish defends that checkmate, and this really cool 
deflection, offering a rook trade, giving up a free pawn on f3, because now when the king moves forward to g2, Anish resigns. Why does Anish resign? Because the game here is over. This knight is hanging, and the rook cannot move off of the file to do it, because this is going to be checkmate here on f7. And so now the match is tied up. We are, again, increasing the time control. It's down to 10 minutes per player. Okay, so this is game five. Najat, he's got the white pieces this time. They redraw every two games. They each have 10 minutes. This game should look pretty familiar. It looks like the other games that Najat started with. And we can see by time spent and usage that these guys aren't really spending any time at all. And they redo a draw right here. They each have tons of time. I guess they wanted a quick draw. Let's see what happens in the next game. Okay, game six, if this one does not end decisively, we're going into a blitz tie break to figure out what happens. I know I mentioned in the last game that these guys didn't want to spend very much time thinking, but this one is really the case where it ends in repetition and they both have more time than they started with with the increment. What the heck is going on? We're going to blitz to decide who's going to move forward in this tournament, potentially making a spot in the candidates tournament. Game seven, Abasov, he drew the white pieces, and we have yet another 99% accuracy game where neither player ever had an advantage. They're just blitzing out their moves. Abasov, though, as we move forward, we can see that he was able to get just a little bit of time advantage by the end of this, but it's just not quite enough. We're going into game eight, and this is the last game. This is the decisive game. The end of it's actually completely insane. You're not going to see it coming. I had to go back and double check everything here. Eighth game opens Anish with e4. That's the first time he's opened with e4 this entire match. This being a blitz game, both players are trying to move as quickly as they can. Abasov, he's able to gain the bishop pair here at the beginning of the game, but the computer's saying that we are equal. Anish, he has some natural development. Maybe he's thinking about transferring over to the king side for an attack. And right here, this super cool rook lift into the middle of the board. That's always going to be really, really sweet to play. And we can see Abasov here. He's slowly pushing his pawn, slowly pushing his pieces forward, gaining a little bit more space, putting the pressure on. Both players are under two minutes. Anish down to about a minute left. And we're pushing that queen back. We're pushing the rook over, forcing this capture. The rook looks like it is almost somehow trapped here, but somehow he's safe on b4. Abasov with a slight advantage. Anish over to e1. He's desperately trying to hold on to that e4 pawn. The queen moves back. And right here, Abasov, he offers a queen trade. The pressure's so, so high, and you will not believe what happens right here. The game actually just ends. The game ends. Anish has 27 seconds left on the clock, and he runs out of time. He's fumbling to make that final queen move, and he's not able to hit the clock before time runs out. And Abasov moves forward to the Chess World Cup, he ends up playing and beating a bunch of other really good players, including Vidit. He loses to Magnus in this tournament and then loses the third place game to Fabiano. And that puts him in fourth place in this event. But as you may know, if you're following the chess world, Magnus, he's not interested in this whole world championship thing again. And so that third spot that gets awarded from this tournament is going to go to the fourth place player. That's going to be Abasov. We're going to see him in the Candidates Tournament. He has a full 100 rating points below every single other player in the Candidates. Let's see how he's able to do. It's going to be awesome. Have a great day, guys. See you around soon.